Yeah. So you have a lot of equipment. This is the first time I've used a third camera. Okay. So I'm going to actually, if you don't mind, have you sit in for one second. My son's finally learning the grooves too, but now I'm into it again too. I might need a little lumbar thing, and I'll tell you why. Is that going to, you're going to rebound if I squeeze that? No. That's a picture of me though. Okay. <clears throat> Voice comes back. I mean, the most Jewish you've ever been right now. Scoot doo, blabbity blue, scoot dee. Oh yeah! Uh, let's check your levels. <clears throat> Do I have to put something on? No. I'm good. You just put it where you want it, and that's fine. But if you move, how do you feel better? All right. You all right? Yeah. <clears throat> Why is my voice so high pitched? I want to be more like Elizabeth Holmes. Do it like that. Talk like that. Uh, okay. Talk lower. Let me hear you deeper. <clears throat> Hello. This is deeper. W A I N uh, in Cle Cleveland. Yeah. All right. I don't think that's too high. <clears throat> all right. What did you do? Did you? What's the story behind this thing behind us? The New York picture. Yeah. Well, for one, and if anyone knows this, it's you. It's the Mecca, New York. It's oh, a it's like a it. great city. So uh, my old apartment, I needed a refrigerator. The one I have now, actually. Okay. I bought it from a friend who had it in a storage unit, along with this couch and this picture. The fridge was going to be 400 bucks or everything in there for a grand. I said, give me the couch. I'll take it all. That desk? Sure. Yeah, so I bought it, and that came with it. And I don't love this piece. It's a cool picture, but it's an Ikea picture. I've seen it all over the place. The, the other thing that I'm questioning is Go ahead. you have uh, some movie lights in this room. Yes. Uh, and you've turned off any normal lamps and stuff. Right. And you've created a look of like a fluorescent lit yeah. office versus like a warm living room. I would love for you to teach me. But I will say I've experimented with the other lights on and... It, I could see how that would screw you up too, but... Yeah. So it, it, them together, it gets confusing. The light is just... Right, you can't mix uh, color temperatures. And without these studio lights that I have going on, the shadows... I'll tell you what you do. You have your nice... Hold on one second. I'm sorry. What did I do now? And then I need you to put... Oh, my God. Put that tea on... You could put this on the floor Jesus and put that Christ. on it. Okay. okay. You would have... If you you can get lights or a fill or a filter to go over your over your film lights to match your regular lights, and then they would all mix together nicely. What do I what do I even what filters do I look for for that? I I think you just want it to look. You want uh, tungsten, I guess it's called. You just like to make it. These are these are, these look like outdoor or like fluorescent -y. When I first moved lights. to LA, I was doing sketches with my buddy John DeWalt. These were the cheapest lights I could get. These are the only lights I've ever used. I think you can literally just get a thing to put over it, a, a gel. Okay. I don't know. I don't know much about lighting either. I just know, <laughs> I know good lighting when I see it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So David, as I've told you before, but the listeners may not know, you're, uh, you're, you're one of my role models. <clears throat> Thank you. That's my, uh, that's my role models. I'm going to have you sign this at the end if it goes well. Okay. Um, but all jokes aside, not that that was a joke. Yeah, let's <laughs> calm down on all the jokes. <laughs> okay. Just kidding. Funny. Hi. I've shadowed you, kind of. I got to go on set while you did some work sometimes. Yeah, well, um, and you were on set with me when we worked together in the movie. On Futile and Super Gesture, but also you let me come to the second season of uh, Wet Hot. Yeah. And... This is a big ask, but do you want to direct this podcast with me? No, because you're doing a great job, and I feel like I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of directors. That's sweet. And it's your artistic vision, and I feel like you, I don't need to... Well, I will probably look into a tungst, tung, tungsten filter. Yeah, something, something like that. All right. So the way I like to do this podcast is it's a little manufactured, obviously, especially at this point, but I like to ask the guests to take their shoes off. Okay. And I kind of want to recreate that as if, so that people at home could understand, oh, this is the tone of the show. Like um, Mr. Rogers. I've thought very much like Mr. Rogers, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to just ask you, to. this is just for the iTunes version, so I'm going to ask you to take your shoes off, and if you could turn away from the mic, but close enough to where we could still hear it. Yeah. And just say, yeah, sure, you know, something like that. Okay. 
Excuse me. Oh, hey, man. Come on in. Hey, good to be here. Would you do me a favor? Take your shoes off. Yeah, I'll take them off. <sighs> take your shoes off podcast with Rick Glassman. I'm Rick Glassman. And today's guest and today's guest is David Wayne. Let me just get the right one off. Okay, cool. And then just going to undo the race on the second one. Really tight. And then got that one off and putting one shoe down. Put the other shoe down. I'm just going to walk over to the couch. Sit down. Put no, on no, the couch. That's my spot. Here's, here's the chair. I'm going to sit down in this chair. I'm going to put on these headphones. And I'm ready to go. Here I am at the mic. Welcome, David. How are you? It's great to be here. It's a lovely day here in uh, LA, California. Yeah. David, you're from Shaker Heights, Ohio, right? I am from Ohio, just like you. Yeah. Hometown. Yeah. You know, um, it's it's tough having a converse as a host of a podcast. I like create the tone, and some of it co is confusing to me because some things I've already said to you, but they need to be established to the people at home. Just be honest. But that means every time I'm going to have to say, "I've already said this to you, David." I just want to make it more natural and, and oh, the, well, just say it now, and then people will know. Okay, so from now on, I need some you things to will be said that we've already said. Yes, and it's okay. I'm just getting the pipe out, you oh, know? Yeah, okay. So. You mentioned you'd gotten some pipe out earlier today when I got here. So come on, man. <laughs> Please. I lit a match. All right. So we met on the Netflix biopic. Biopic or biopic? I always thought it was biopic, but no, biopic. Biopic makes more sense. A lot more sense. We met on the National Lampoon bi biopic. Yeah. And I auditioned for the role of Harold Ramis. That's right. And that was with casting director Allison Jones. That is right. And Allison Jones. Terrific casting director. Fantastic. We're hope, actually having her on our podcast next month. I hope to get to work with her again. I'll let her know. Okay. She worked with me a bit. I went in there twice before I got to you. Wow. And after the first time, she had mentioned, I think maybe you had said something to her, but about my voice. What do you need? It's too loud. Just a little bit down sure. on mine, on the cans. Great. Thank you. Good. Let's split the diff. Thank you. <laughs> Good? Yeah. And after the first time, I believe there was a note that you gave her, or she just thought of it, which was, I should do a different voice, a little slower, a little deeper. Yeah, that was from me. And then I went in, and, and I, I met with a couple of voice coaches, which I'd never done before, oh and it God. was way too expensive. So thank you for doing this. We're even now. Thank you for doing that. Absolutely. And then... I should have a voice coach for today. I feel like I'm not present in the way that I'd like to be coming from my sternum. <clears throat> but I'm, I'll, we'll get there. The construction upstairs. It's bothering you. I'm going to ignore for a second. But if I have to explain, it's been months. And I leave a note when I'm doing a podcast to keep it down. Yeah. They're not doing They're not going to do it. Oof. You know, what they see? you know what happens when they get that note? They look at it and they say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have to go knock on their door. No, you're not. It's part of the, it's part of the atmosphere. Yeah. It's real life here. Okay. I mean, you, we don't want to be in a, in a sterile environment. We want to be living life. This is real. This is the shit. Well, when you're directing something and there's some sound that gets in the way, don't you hold for sound? I say, we'll fix it later. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, I, I mean, usually I'm working on things that are really low budget and you don't have time, you don't have those luxuries to be like, let's wait. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'll take your advice for now. All and right. that's By the way, you're the director. Well, that, I was going to say that's less of a direction note and more of a you're a person that has done a lot that I aspire to. So I feel like some of the obstacles that you have gone through in your life, you've learned to let certain things go. Sure. But you've done plenty and you own three cameras and two microphones at least. Yeah. And four microphones. You're fine. You know, you know what, what's right for you. Nobody can out Rick Glassman, Rick Glassman. I've been saying that for months. I appreciate yeah. it. So back to the the audition story okay after the second time i went in i was home and i got a uh a, a, an email from it's so it's so distracting to me whatever you want dude all right i'm gonna see what i could do okay i'm gonna try this for a few minutes for the listeners at home i apologize for going all over the place it's hard for me to be present if i'm not present so i can relax and play with my phone or something i'm just gonna make sure it's turned off then you know what i'm gonna do next one i'm gonna knock uh, okay i can't even comment i w whatever you need to do or don't do that's your business. It doesn't bother me. I got the headphones on. I'm listening to you through the microphone. Yeah, I just got to relax. People make noises. I'm not telling you what to do. So I got an email from Allison Jones, and she said, David wants to FaceTime with you. Oh. Yeah. Have you heard this? I, I remember my side of it. I would love to hear that. 
But when she said that, I got excited because, oh, this is kind of like uh, I'm testing, you know? Yeah. And I FaceTime with you right here. Mm-hmm. It was just you were at an airport. You had headphones on and it was loud and you didn't ask anyone to be quiet, just like you are right now. Yeah. I was thinking, David, why don't you tell them to be quiet? Just like I am now. It would have been so hard to tell hundreds of people in an airport to be quiet. I mean, if I had said, I, it's Rick Glassman. Sure. You never know. But at the time, I wasn't This even. was before the Take Off Your yes. Shoes podcast yes. went bl- blew up. So we did it. And it was just one of the cooler experiences I've ever had because I still have up on my bulletin board directors I want to work with that has been there for probably 10 years now. And there's two names on it, you and Edgar Wright. Oh, wow. And that was up there, and now I'm FaceTiming with you, and that's, I remember, I don't know if you remember, but I even showed it to you. I was like, this is so cool. Plus, what a cool project this, this thing was. It was super cool. And then it was, it was five minutes of me doing what I was doing, and then you're like, a little lower, a little higher, could you do this? And, and then you're like, great, that's great. And then we, we hung up, and I called my dad right away, and I was like, I think, I, I think I'm going to do this movie with David. Oh, you should have waited till you knew for sure. I tell my, I, I don't, I tell my dad... <laughs> everything in the moment as where it's coming because if i had thought you really sucked i would have still said great that's great oh wow i i don't see you as that no but i wouldn't be lying i'd be like great thanks for doing that like okay great you know that's fair but it wasn't just based off of you saying great it was based off of me feeling like i was like right you for got this it. thing yeah that's and fair. the reaction i felt about myself matched what you gave me so oh so you had a gut and your gut was right yeah what's your side of the story I mean, I, I think uh, the it just reminds me of the fact that because we can do these things, we do do these things, like I'm FaceTiming with you from an airport when it would be nice if when we're traveling, we're just traveling, you know, and it's, we can work 24-7 and kind of, uh, this is sort of an unrelated-ish, but like right now I'm doing post-production on another show and- Children's Hospital. It's the Children's Hospital spinoff, Medical Police. Mm-hmm. And because we can and because we have to, four producers are all over the place and we're on Google Docs and back and forth and like trying to make editorial decisions that really should be done in the edit room with people sitting there, human beings working together, working with the editor. But it has to be just like everyone's got the thing on their computer and looking at a piecemeal and making and having these debates. And this is a similar thing. Like, ideally, I wish I could have met you and sat down with you just in a more human way to start this project. But as it was, I didn't need that, and we, I get the right vibe. You know. Well, the, the as far as pros and cons, obviously, the pro to that is it's more efficient. You could do it on your own, everyone's own time. Uh, what are the cons of that? Why would you rather have everyone in the editing bay at the same time? Well, in the editing bay, because I feel like when, especially when there's a chance that people will disagree with each other, or there's anything to talk about beyond like do this yes no which is everything in editing it's all subtleties it's it's always it's never really a or b it's like well but then what if it's mm-hmm. every frame you move something affects everything in editing and so you want to have human beings working together and also uh, so often when you disagree about something it feels yuckier when you're doing it via a text format like a Google Doc or on a notes document or in, in emails, when whereas you have the um, advantage of body language and tone of voice to understand more clearly and more and just have a, a more human interaction. Well, why don't you establish that that's the way you're going to do it? Well, that is what we try to do, but it, as budgets and schedules and other people's other projects dictate, sometimes it's not possible. So you you direct all of them. This show, uh, Medical Police, I directed half of the 10 episodes. And you're, are you the showrunner of it? Me and three other people, yeah. So in the editing bay, it's you, those three other people, plus producers, correct? Uh, well, we are the producers. So it's me. Well, isn't, is John Stern in there? Yeah. There's, there's four of us, including John Stern. Who, oh, he's one of, the, one of the four showrunners. Yeah, we created the show, the four of gotcha. us together. It's Rob Corddry, Christopher Johnson, John Stern, and myself. And we, we wrote it, wrote the pilot, created the show and we are children's the, hospital as well no but we are the executive producers children's hospital was technically originally created by rob cordry um, but it was run for its seven seasons by me rob cordry and john stern but also to answer your question it's different in casting for me sometimes because the point of casting film or television is you want to see how they look on tv 
or film. And it's less about what they're like in the room. In fact, that can sometimes cloud your vision, I think. Um, because you, you're seeing the person and not the character they're playing? Well, you're auditioning to see how they will play on screen, not how they play in front of you in, per, in person. And so hmm. sometimes it's nice to just to see. And also, um, there's a certain objectivity that comes uh, when you're, you're just meeting the person on screen. Tell me the difference. I, I understand it logically, but tell me the difference of this conversation you and I are having right now, you're looking at me. I, yeah. And then... Tomorrow you watch this from the camera's point of view. What could you possibly see differently? I'm not going to watch this tomorrow, or anytime. whenever I whenever I, I will never it watch then. it. So in a month when I I will this to never you. watch it. I promise you. Okay, if you were to watch it, okay, um, and let's say that's in two months, okay, or never. What would you? What would be different if you were in the room with Allison Jones and I? But if I was judging, if I was judging, if I was having to select from a a group of candidates for a role, uh, meeting you in person, it's not really the visual that's so completely different, It's but it actually sometimes it is. Sometimes people just pop on screen in a way that they don't in person and vice versa. It happens all the time. Could you give me an example of somebody who pops on screen and not in person? Edward Norton is someone who I knew from college and those, those that time in my life. And he- NYU, both of you? No, my-, my my uh, best friend I grew up with went to Yale with Edward um, at Yale. <laughs> and uh, I knew him for during that, that period of time. And he just seemed to me um, fairly neutral in the way he struck you as a person. Uh, basically somewhat forgettable. Um, and then the moment I ever first saw him up on a screen, I was like, oh my God. Do you remember what you saw him in first? Yeah, Presumed Innocent. Why? What is that? How is that um, possible? Wait, that's not the. That's not what it is. It's a different one. Or no, maybe it was. His big breakout that he was nominated for an Oscar for. I don't think. I think my introduction to him, and obviously it was late, was Rounders. Yeah, so could be. But uh, his first big splash was he. You know, he sent an audition tape. It's exactly this. Exactly. We're talking about exactly. He sent an audition tape for this movie, and he has this accent, and it's very convincing, and. Uh, no one knew that it wasn't his real accent because no one knew who he was. And he just somehow got this tape in, is the story I think I heard. And uh, that's, um, you know, he's he's one of those guys that's um, like a movie star. And he, he, he somehow, ever, for me, I love him. I love his his thing. And I think every moment he's on screen, I'm enwrapped. I want to watch. I, I, I can't take my eyes off. How is that? How is a camera see excitement that we with a naked eye can't see? Oh, I don't know. That's 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 truly there is a magic to that. I think you know they say the camera likes certain people, or I I, I think that's true. I think some people just light up on a movie screen or a TV hmm. screen. I wonder if I light up on a movie. Screen. I don't know how. I think you do. That's why you. That's why you're good in movies. Oh, thanks. I've done one movie. Whatever. Doesn't matter. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, you and uh, Ben Kirster Stiller? Johnson. Chris, Christer. Christer. Christer Johnson. Christer Johnson. I met on Futile. Yeah. And I didn't know what anyone's relationship to anybody was. I just met people on that project. I don't know your your circle yet. And then I saw him at Wet Hot. Yeah. And now you're saying he's one of the showrunners on... on um, I'm saying it because it's true. Sure. And first the state... And the state became... I found you from before... My brother loved the state. I became... I was in the comedy troupe, The State, called yes. The State. Just for... Are you clarifying who, for people? Oh, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Thank you. There was a comedy troupe in the... in the Probably started in the early 90s, mid-90s? We started in the late 80s, but we our TV show on MTV started in the early 90s. And my brother loved it. I remember him watching, and I watched a few, but I don't really remember them. I found Stella, which was your show with Michael Ian Black and Showalter. Yeah. Probably 98, 99, I don't uh, remember. 2005 on Comedy Central, and then we had our shorts were before that in... I found the shorts. The late bef 90s. Before the show. Yeah, I remember really. when the show came out, I was like, oh, I love these guys. Yeah. But the state had... Uh, is the aughts the 2000 or 2010? I don't know. Well, yeah. Okay. But yeah, the aughts then. Early aughts, late 90s. But um, Joe Triglio. Joe Lotrilio. And Thomas Lennon. Yeah. And Michael Ian Black. Yeah. Show Walter Yu. And I know there were more. Uh, oh. Um, Carrie Kenny. Ken Marino. Marino. You guys have been working together and doing things together f since you started. Yeah. And I didn't know that connection in a corny way comparing it to... A few talents, stupid gesture. 
I know all of these people that are in it, you know, Chevy Chase and Gilda Radner and Belushi and Saturday Night Live. I didn't know the origin story of it. And just people become friends and then they like working with each other and that continues. Yeah. And it seems you have your group. And part of that group from Wet Hot American Summer included Amy Poehler and Bradley Cooper and Paul Rudd. Yeah. What was your relationship to them? How did you know them? What made you want them? Because they weren't in it with you since the late 80s, early 90s. Well, Amy, I had met uh, through Upright Citizens Brigade before it was everything it is, was just the four of them, just a group, uh, an improv Which was uh, Walsh? Matt Walsh, Ian uh, Roberts, Matt Besser. And, and, and uh, Amy. And Amy. And um, they came from Chicago to New York in the early 90s, I guess, uh, around the time of... Um, or the maybe the mid late nineties, but uh, when we were all doing you know, Luna Lounge alternative show, um, what is that? But well, in New York, uh, I guess it was sort of yeah the mid late nineties. There was a bar called Luna Lounge, and before that, it was at another bar called Rebar, where it was the first alternative stand up thing that happened in New York, and it was where stand ups or non stand ups could come and do non traditional material, um, and it was the first time for this this one push of of comedians and so you'd go to this bar it was like a tiny bar and a tiny back room and once a week they had the show and you'd go in on a typical night it was like mark Marin would host and it's louis ck and janine garofalo and todd berry and um on and on and on it was an incredible um scene um and of the people in the state that were part of that it was primarily me and Michael Showalter and Michael Ian Black. And that's our show. Stella was an outgrowth of that scene. But you were asking about something else. <laughs> so where that's where you were telling me where you met Polar and then. Oh, oh so I met Polar because th yeah, those guys came and did a really. That's where you met Walsh at the same time then. Yeah. All four of them showed up at Luna Lounge one night and did this bit to kind of introduce themselves to the scene. And it was pretty incredible. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, and they've done it since then too, but basically it was one of them, I think Matt Besser was on stage and he was introduced just as Matt Besser and he's doing this audience interaction bit and he starts um, kind of talking to the woman sitting next to me in the show and trying to like egg her on and get her to answer questions and stuff and she's like, really, don't pick me, I don't want to talk. And nobody, nobody knew any of these people. Mm -hmm. And... I didn't know it was Amy Poehler because she was just a random person. And she, he's like, what did you do today? What did you do today? And she's like, really, I don't want to talk. And then finally he gets it out of her that she had an abortion. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like, oh God. <laughs> and it feels totally real. Sure. And then there's all their stuff happening. The other two are involved in also in the audience and other, I can't remember all the ins and outs of it, but it's so funny. But then there's an audio track <laughs> that comes on and you hear his inner thoughts. And so you becomes that's how it becomes clear that it was a planned uh -huh. bit. And you're just like, oh my God, who is that? And then I remember the host that night was like, that was the Upright Citizens Brigade. And we're like, who, what, 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 what's, what are they doing next? You know, and then they kept going from there. And they watch you perform as well as the, as the well, state? We, I mean, no, because the state was done by then, well, long before then. Uh, the state, oh, so they probably already knew who you were then? Um, they, yeah, they probably knew who we were then. But we and I went to go see their shows that they did on Fourth Street. They just did their improv shows before they had their own theater, and, it was, and I didn't know them super well. But uh, so then, by the time it was ninety nine, when we were auditioning for, or no, early two thousand, we were auditioning for Wet Hot. Um, she, we asked her to come and, and read for it. Yeah. So Wet Hot American Summer is, I assume, your probably what you're best known for. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, I would, I guess probably for most people that would know anything about what I've done, but it depends on, you know, sure. it depends on who you ask. But Wet Hot American Summer at the time was the biggest thing you had done, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I hadn't, all I had done was the state and, and that was pretty much it. I mean, the, the most successful thing I'd done financially by far was the role models. Role models sure. Uh, which came after that. Yeah. So Wet Hot comes out, uh, you guys are auditioning in 99. Uh, probably 2000. We shot it in May of 2000. So I'm sure we were auditioning, you know, a couple months before that. What was the process? So you and Showalter wrote that, correct? Yeah. And when did you write? How long before you guys were auditioning did you write that? 
we actually started writing it in the spring of 1997 um, because we had written, we were working on something else and we wanted to do something fast and quick and get it done. And we thought that same summer we could shoot something super cheap if we wrote something that was designed for basically all our friends to be in and that we could shoot during the day outside somewhere with you know no location fee. And, that seems super fast. To well, it write. all, it all, it, it ballooned right then. Like we started writing it and we're like, oh, this is more that we were going to just write an outline because we were inspired by our friend Sam Cedar who had shot this feature length film just based on an outline and it was really awesome what's the movie it's called um who's the caboose and it's incredible okay um i i don't know exactly how to find it or see it i'm sure i could find it. i've never heard of it but it's, i would love to it, watch it It stars sam cedar and sarah silverman and it's my favorite sort of portrait of what hollywood is really like that i've ever seen cool um but anyway so and that inspires you because you see a friend making something that yeah was... and he was working from an, out, an outline Everyone in it was just improving. Um, oh, there was no final draft. There was no script. No, there was no script. He he just was shooting scenes totally improv, and he was shooting things in real places. Like, you know, he was going to Luna Lounge, and it was about showbiz, and so he would just really go to these places and whatever. Kind of like how Curb Your Enthusiasm is shot now. Something like that, exactly like that, actually. Right. Um, and so uh, we were inspired by that, but it, I think as it turned out for us at that time. That just wasn't really innately our style. We came up from the mm. state and NYU film school, and we were like much more about crafting the words and you know figuring it out on the page and and doing a slightly different style. You also have a lot of jokes that are done direct directionally. Yeah, one of my favorite ones, and it's so simple, but is in uh, Role Models when we first meet. Oh, I'm so bad with names. Me too. Um, uh, the you know the the, the, the sturdy, wing, sturdy wings uh, uh, woman uh, Jane Lynch Jane Lynch thank you she is it's a video and she's with the kids and <laughs> she's talking about how she's an addict and then she shimmies out of frame of the camera and then we reveal she's in this room talking to everybody and it's such a simple thing but I noticed it right away I remember I rewound it it is it's the bottom so you of, had it on VHS uh, I've watched the movie a fair amount of okay. times uh, and I noticed it and then when I have it uh, Blu-ray. Yeah. I just run on the Blu-ray. Uh, the the bottom of the frame is the bottom of the television, so there's no way of seeing her leg, which is clear mathematically. That's what the joke need be. But it's so perfect that by the time she, you're pulling out, by the time she's revealed, you see to the right of the TV and underneath where it's so obvious that she's... And it's just... It, it's people like you who notice and comment on things like that that give me great joy. I, I assure you, even the people that don't consciously recognize that would not laugh the way they did if subconsciously they didn't notice it well, because it's a, it's truly a reveal as opposed to just a coincidental shot. My theory and my hope, yeah, putting all those little things in is something I really enjoy and I and I'm and I it adds for me to those things. The reason I bring that up is because and also by the way, one of the reasons why you're one of two on there is just there's an infinite amount of jokes. You know, tonally you don't want to keep doing them, but find them where you can and just you find jokes where other people wouldn't find them and it's fun because that I'm, also comes from cast too like comes from actors who do that and you have to allow it and yeah. recognize it and it's all about creating and and selecting those things in edit that's that's why i i, w I was bringing up as far as uh having just beat beats and you improvising which is super fun i think you get the best performances that way but you can't get you can't block those shots and you can't find those jokes so you also are, I know, just from the people you work with, improv heavy as far as alts. And is that fair? I guess I'm assuming that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I would say that a lot of what I've done is less improv heavy than one might think. A lot less. Um, Case in point. And, and I think that, um, yes, you're right. I've worked with some of the best comedians and improvisers around. And, and in many cases, their improvs are some of the great moments. But... I'm also a big believer kind of in the other side of the continuum, which is that there's a lot to be said for thinking something through ahead of time and crafting something on the page and taking the time over weeks and months to think through the structure and the feel and the lines and the words and the syllables of a scene um, in the classic uh, way things have been done for centuries. Um, and I do think that there's, there has been a trend over 20 years in comedy of uh, valuing improvisation so much so uh, too far 
in many right. cases or or not understanding how to do that you know i think a lot of people saw movies like uh, knocked up and they're like oh it's you know it's all improvised and then but they don't know they don't have it takes a lot more than just that to make it really work and certainly you know curb your enthusiasm is awesome but there's different styles and mm-hmm. t- to me i think i mean i've used i take from both but i think I, I've been I've been involved in things and I've seen things that go too far and you, there's there's a pitfall of things. What have you seen that's gone too far? Well, there's sometimes a movie will have a a feel that you can you can feel it whether it's consciously or not that you're watching a cut down of an improv session mm-hmm. instead of a scene. Right. Um. And I'm not, I can't even think of or care to name any examples, but it's just it's one it's a pitfall and it's something that I think. Uh, you can go both ways. Yeah, something can be more alive and more exciting if it's um, if it's comes off the cuff. But sometimes I almost think there's a stigma of like, oh, if it's written down on the page, then it must not be good. So I have a interesting relationship with improvisation that I'm recognizing comes from a, a place of unawareness, which is I'm aware logically that something is fun. If there's something scripted or something, even if it was improvised, but we've done it a few times, I don't love to rehearse because of this. It loses something to me, not not definitely, but to right. me it does. So when you improvise something, even if it's if it's not as funny or if it's not as efficient and or takes longer to get to the punchline, there's something fresh about it, which definitely translates as a performer. But I'm I, I I'm aware that exists, but I'm not sure is this funnier or is this just the other thing I've done five times. See, but what's weird about it is that in a movie or a TV show, that's not really your job. Of, uh, uh, seeing you know? the forest, the, the 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 forest through the trees, or but whatever. But on, on a theater stage or on a stand-up stage, that's entirely your job. But in in a movie, you're you need to be in that character, and you need to like Agreed. serve whatever's there, and you need to do whatever's needed. And sometimes that's long form improv, and that's sometimes it's just playing around. Sometimes it's just sticking to the words, whatever the system is set up. But then. It's the director and the editor that figure out whether that feels fresh or not. Well, that's why I'm asking you because ultimately what I want to direct and that's what I want to do. And as a writer director speaking to you, that's kind of what I'm asking. How do you know? Tungsten. You need tungsten lights. um, Believe me, I'm there. (laughs) I am there with the lights. How do you know when... I don't even know how to articulate... I think I know how to articulate this question. Okay, you're, you have a script and you get the shot you want and you have time. So now let's do a fun one. I believe what you would say is this one's for you. That's what you would probably tell the yes, actor. That's a classic thing. You, you shoot the script and then let's you know do whatever you want. Basically, we already got on base. Here's a, here's a free hit. Let's see if we can get a home run. Yeah. Probably not going to use it, but it's good for morale anyway. My style in general, and by the way, it changes from scene to scene, actor to actor, project to project. Everything's different and you have to go as your gut. So like which... What level of yes. playing around makes sense for this? From any and and things that affect it are, what kind of actor it is? What's the budget? Anything, but more than not, I'll default to let's do the scripted version a few times because that's what you're playing with the editor. Like let's let's really take these words and without changing the words around or the structure of the scene, let's find some different subtleties within the words. You know, and then you've got lots to work with in the edit room. That's really great. Then I might say. At the end, now just blow it all out. Do do, do literally anything, you know, and take it wherever you want to go. Um, and then sometimes what you often get is the actors just by instinct will still stick to the words without even thinking about it, but end up adding a little flair to it. You've worked with some of the greatest comedians uh, of all time and of different strength levels. Are there certain actors that even if you want to get it, the scripted version that you know just shine so much as an improviser that you just kind of, we got to let them at least do their thing one or two takes? Yes, yes. But it still has to do with what it is and what we're doing. I mean, it does like, you know, uh, for example, okay, like go. Bill Hader is one of the greatest, I think, improvisers ever. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so, I mean, I've worked, yes, I've worked many. But when Bill Hader came and did, they came together. I had eight hours to shoot the entire uh, bracketing of an entire Real quick, movie. for those of you who don't know, they came together. It's uh, Paul Rudd, Amy Poehler, in a romantic comedy that's completely deconstructing what romantic comedies are. Right. And you're using all the devices so well that it's a legit romantic comedy while still acknowledging it. And what we did is, in post-production, we decided 
to throw out a third of the movie at least and replace it with this storytelling device of I've heard that story. I didn't know people that was sitting true. around the table. Yeah. And that's when you added Bill Hader. Yeah. And uh, we had no more money left, whatever. So we had literally eight hours to get the entire. You did all that in one day? Less than, yeah. I mean, less than a day because we had financial and schedule constraints as well. Wow. And so we shot all of that in one day. And we had, so that was not, we had, we had three cameras and no time. And so it was like, Yes, we had a little bit of room for improv and a little bit of room to try some alts and stuff. But basically, I was like, now say this, now say this, now say this. We kept rolling and just to get, we had so much material to get through. Um, and, and this last thing, Medical Police that I'm working on now also is a pretty tight schedule and budget. And so we had similar time sometimes. That um, and, and, and my first thing, Wet Hot American Summer, was we shot that one camera. Every bit of film that we had on 35 millimeter film was very expensive. We had very little time moving fast and so often take times we do one take and then move on yeah so i have a i have a few questions about wet hot so i'm going to try to keep that in its own segment before i get to it i want to ask you another question by the way and if anyone has further questions about the making of wet hot we recently uh, published a book about it called wet hot american summer the annotated screenplay hold up like this and i'll put in a picture of it say it again we have a book called wet hot american summer the annotated screenplay you can buy on amazon cool in the um they came together when you're basically, when you're having the dinner table scene, that one day shoot. Is the reason you put that in there? My thought was, because I heard that story, and then I questioned, why did they add it? And I thought, without that, I don't know if enough people would realize what you were, the intention of this movie. That was part of it. What's, what else? Well, the, cause, see, the mo <clears throat> they came together is basically a classic formula romantic comedy, but stupid and funny mm -hmm. and sort of a spoof of it and also it, again so you did it so to what they are there's some broad moments that are yeah. supposed to be there but on its own is it it just the device is strong enough it's just a great romantic comedy still uh thank you but and we were hoping just especially you know relying on paul rudd and amy poehler who are so come on you know charismatic first in the shower and their chemistry is so real and so to let them let that carry it when there's, you know, it's filled with, it's wall to wall jokes that undercut the romance in a certain mm -hmm. way, but they don't it, ultimately because it's it's them. That um, makes sense. They're why it's believable. But in the earlier cuts that did not include this whole storytelling device dinner table scene, what you said was true sometimes. Some people just sort of took it more at face value and weren't getting what it is. Mm -hmm. And this helped tell the audience in a much more overt, direct way, this is a story dumb romantic comedy or like this is a this is like a romantic comedy but it isn't really mm -hmm. like something like that and then it also we just felt like for better or worse this movie really is m more than anything about the jokes and the comedy and what what makes you laugh and we found that you know about half of it was like big big laughs and about half of it was like okay laughs and so we took all the okay laughs and cut them out. You just kept the fire. And used the storytelling device to allow ourselves to skip over so smart. whole scenes and whole set pieces or whole parts of scenes and just have the people at the table say, and then this happened, then this right. happened, moving on to the next part. And so now what's left is just the funny parts. A, a, a ridiculous question, but you said it was three cameras. Is Were there multiple setups or did you just have... No. So, so what two are shot, you, it's you have four two people shot, around a table, right? One shot of two people, one shot of two people, one shot of all four. That's it. And you just kept, you didn't move anything, and it was lit for it was lit for it was all lit angles once and done, basically. I I don't I'm not even sure. I think we, then we had at the end of the day we had one other shot where he turns around at the very end of the movie and says, you know, I told you it was going to be a crazy day. Yeah. And I yeah. think that was literally it. I don't think I think we we didn't have time. I to noticed because there was a focus was a little. I wasn't sure if it was intentional, but the focus was not shot for that. And it seemed right. like he just did that. Yeah, no, I mean, it was really quite uh, simple. We ha we kept it so simple and all about performance. And so we did have time to get a couple takes of things because we did not have any new setting up to do. Once the cameras were there, they were there. I'm going to leave that came together, but I want to just sit, comment on one more thing about it. You do a joke in there that that connected with me strongly that you obviously heard a whole bunch of times, but... The first time I heard it, I'll tell you my experience of it, was I was on an NBC show called Undateable. It took place in Detroit. Big fan. Thank you so much. And Bill Lawrence, the, our, our showrunner, in 
whenever we were um, in front of the network, we were talking. Uh, he was basically selling the show. He's so good at making like letting people think something was improvised in the moment, even though we did it before. He's just like trying to hype everyone up. And one of the things he kept saying was to make to make this show feel alive was that, by the way, Detroit is a character in this show. <laughs> and I heard it. I was the first time I heard it, but I heard him say it a few times to where it was already ironic to me. And I haven't heard that as a device that other people use. And then before you uh, uh, show and acknowledge the aerial shot of New York, you say, so basically what you're saying is New York is, and you, is a character in the show. And you said it like five times. And it was, oh, that was when I realized, oh, other people have noticed how silly this thing is. And that joke felt very personal to me. I love that joke. Love it. Well, and then whenever we had screenings at festivals or whatever, I made sure in my opening speech to just say, just so everyone understands, New York is <laughs> is a, a character in the film as well. You know, so like, you've heard people say that before. Is that why no, you're? I just you're feel like yeah, I feel it? like it's such, in any interview about any movie that takes place anywhere. <laughs> they're always like, you know, uh, New York City is not just the setting of the movie; it's also another character, and it's just like it's it's a it's not. Right. It's the setting. <laughs> right. And B, we it's not interesting. Like everyone said that a thousand times and it's so stupid. I haven't even heard it that much. I and just, I've heard it since then too, many times. Like it's just so dumb. I just yeah, it's just one of those things that I mean it's not it's that stupid and I love it, which is basically about how I feel about all rom com tropes. Mm -hmm. Like I love them and they're and they are silly. But um then we also in the posters, in every poster for they came together, it says in the bottom with the rest of the billing oh, block. Yeah, right. You know, please note, um, New York City is, an, is also a character in the film. <laughs> so back to Wet Hot and the casting of where you you have these these guys that you've been working with for years, but then Amy Poehler and Bradley Cooper. Well, Amy Poehler, as I mentioned, we, we knew her. Right, that's asked, how you met Amy. I want to know how you met in. Paul Rudd and Bradley Cooper. Paul Rudd, uh, we had also known loosely, uh, he had done um, Romeo and Juliet with our friend Zach Orth. And so we met him around Stella... The, the nightclub show we were doing in New York. And then he came to see our play that Joe LaChulio and Shalter and I wrote called Sex, AKA Wieners and Boobs at the Here Theater in New York. And he was like, your humor is up my alley. And so we were like, great, you know, will you be in our movie? And that's basically how we met him basically around asking him to be in our movie. He had already done Clueless by that point. Yeah. And he'd done Object of My Affection, a big mm -hmm. rom-com with, um, and 200 cigarettes. I, he's not by any means a movie star in the moment, though, right? He's people and Now he is, I think. Of course. Oh. But I'm saying at that time... No, no. He Well, he had played a the romantic lead with Jennifer Aniston in a movie. But no, no one had ever heard of him. But, I mean, he was, a, he was something. He, he, we knew he was... He, for, for financing an independent film at the time, he did add value. Was he... Six inches. Really? Hard? Was he f that? Because he's so funny. And Anchorman and Wet Hot, to me, are his his funniest characters that he's ever played. One of the greatest scenes in, in comedy, to me, is when Paul Rudd is asked to pick up the silverware. Yeah. And then he has to just... It's 20 seconds of him sighing and just being big. <sighs> he goes into Wet Hot, and he's surrounded by comedians. I don't know if Paul Rudd was a comedian, did he become funny? Did he already have that in him? I think he already had it in him. He he grew up always a comedy fan, and he is just born genius. I mean, like it's obvious he's he's one of the most talented natural uh, actors I've ever seen in my life, uh, worked with or not worked with. Um, I see him pick up in in a way that's a credit to him. I see him pick up these devices and tools yeah. that then he uses them in later movies. But I will tell you, I didn't know that. I, I can tell you that I thought he was a nice guy and seemed like a decent actor, and you know, had a little name value. And I was like, sure, cast him. It never occurred to me that he would be genius. So when you're on set and he's doing these monster physical moments yeah you're discovering that in the moment so do you build them out more do you give him more of them no Is it already made it's already wet hot we basically shot that script exactly as as it was on the page almost entirely because we didn't have time to think about it any other way but i but i have to say i didn't fully fully appreciate his performance until later like later in the editing i i just didn't really quite clock just how great he was 
Is that something because you were so distracted as a director, or was it that you're seeing somebody pop on screen like you saw Norton? I think I no, it was. I think I was new as a director. Yeah, and I was thinking about a million things, right. and I, yeah, I don't think I really realized because he he was funny in such a different way than the people that I knew so well. Yeah, and you know, many of the people in Wet Hot, even at that time, I had worked with for so long already, decades, and Ken Marino and Joel Julio, et cetera. So yeah. And Bradley, how does he come into the picture? He literally just auditioned. He came in off the street. He had he, he done anything else? Nope. He was in he was in acting school, and he skipped his graduation to be in Wet Hot. Yeah, I've seen him inside the actor studio. Uh, is that the acting school you're talking about? Uh, yeah, and he was he was um, Wet Hot was his first job, and Elizabeth Banks too. Did did he audition for you, or was it FaceTime? Yeah. No, he came in, and is we he didn't have FaceTime. I know. Is he funny? I know he is, and he's uh, he's unbelievable. I'm saying in Wet Hot when he comes in, he also was, what did he offer you? He also seemed like right for the part and funny and um, uh, congenial and sort of appealing. What does that mean to me? Like he just he was, he was good looking and he like had a an air about him and a vibe that I thought was really good. Did I see mm-hmm. a future Oscar winning actor director? machine force of nature no i didn't recognize that looking back at all the things he's done in the order he did it not the order i saw it it came out in in wedding crashers and his performance in wedding right. crashers like oh this guy has this thing but i also getting to know him a little bit during the making of wet hot i saw that's when i really saw the seeds of his hunger and his energy and his ability he's got that almost you know like tom cruise sort of like endlessly curious endlessly needing to understand and want to know and want to and loving everything and getting so much enjoyment out of every aspect of the process and every person he met and so you're saying he has a curiosity and that is something that is a benefit to him a curiosity and a follow-through i think is a these are things that i you know try to have but not nothing like him like he i don't think his success is remotely a fluke you know he he works cr- like crazy and i see i mean i don't know him super well anymore so wet hot you're you're making it and you have this camp location which i went to shout out to emma kaufman camp a jewish sleepaway camp that was this movie yeah and then it just it rains the entire time isn't that right we are making this first time ever independent film out in uh this camp in pennsylvania and it rained almost every day and like poured rain almost every day the the movie it takes uh, place outside and, the and, and, it, and it show when, when you watch the movie there it, it you didn't use the rain to the, for in the production. It looks just like a beautiful summer. Because unless you're looking for it. It's everywhere. <laughs> I haven't watched Looking For It, and I yeah. will, and I'll probably ask you some questions later. Um, yeah. But that means you have to basically just stop, and then we're waiting for it to go, and then we go. Well, we did some of that. We did a lot of moving scenes inside that we had scripted to be outside, a lot of scenes like that. That makes sense. We did a lot of scenes where it was supposedly outside, but we had a cover over us. Uh, and then the sound was terrible, and we had to redo the sound in post. And then we had other scenes uh, where we, yeah, where we waited, or and other scenes we just shot in the rain. Give and me an it, example of one that we could see like that. Which what you said, unless you're looking for it, and then you could see it's all over oh, the place. Oh well, uh, when Amy Poehler and Bradley Cooper in the breakfast scene first, you can see rain dripping. Out. We had tried to block the rain outside the window, but only could do it so much. Um, you can see it. You can see the mud everywhere in every almost many many scenes Mm. a lot of times though we actually just shot in the rain and you know if you're not lighting for it you don't see it necessarily i see that analogous to knowing very little but the way you had to operate from when i got to come and watch you do wet hot the uh 10 years later or the second season of yeah and uh there was a moment that i was sitting with you and you were scheduling things out and it looked like kind of like what you're talking about of these google documents multiple things that to me, it seemed like uh, puzzle pieces in a very cool way. It's a fun puzzle. Which I don't think most directors either seek or have to deal with or want to, for that matter. But you were doing... There were some days that you had characters that were in the scene together that weren't there on the same day. So you had to block... That was so often the case. Uh, because you have a, a certain budget and some of these people are movie stars now. Right. And they could only come in at a certain time. Could you give? An, could you explain how one of those came through? I mean, I would have to imagine you'd have to probably green screen some of it and just it was just basically. I mean, a lot of it was just you know when you shoot an, a scene in any movie, you often have different angles on different characters, mm-hmm. and so a lot of it was just we shot those different angles often on different days. We had a dinner scene at the end of Wet Hot American Summer ten years later 
that we went back to the same set seven times to get the one scene because we had seven groups of people in the scene that were scheduled on different days of the shoot. So which means there's no master shot and you have to match the lighting perfectly. Right, but then in some cases like that one, we did have master shots where we would comp two different things together from different days or three in that case. Do you find that editing or is that something you have or to four. block? So you have to basically, do you have to lock off shots and measure? It all depends, yeah. I mean, you know, in some, we didn't have the luxury of motion control, but we would do... Um, Explain what motion control is. Motion control is where you can recreate a camera move exactly by having a camera support system that that you can, it records. So you have a camera on a tripod or on a, on a dolly that's on a track, but the entire system that holds the camera and moves it and pans it and everything, you do the move once, and then two weeks later, it can recreate that exact move again. Like if a player you, piano. Yeah, and that's how they do a lot of things. Like if you have Orphan Black, you know, where you've got mm -hmm. two people one person playing two characters in the same scene or something, you'd have to use motion control. And they use it for a million things. We never we never had motion control, but we had, we, so we would just, for example, the at the end of Wet Hot 10 years, there's a scene where all, everyone in this whole restaurant is, is toasting. And each table was a different day. And then some people even at the tables were even yet another day. And we just basically had the same camera setup that we had to match and recreate each time we did it. And then we put it all together later. Looks great. Thank you. You and Showalter did a lot together. Yeah. And you guys, where'd you guys meet? NYU with, uh, during the state. You met at school. At, uh, and, and then yeah. he's, are you, you're a comedian, he's a comedian. And then you say, or you no, we, well, did jokes and, oh, you're funny. Let's make something. Uh, we were, we had been together in this comedy troupe for years before we started. But I'm saying but bef before that, where do you guys meet? How do you become so, this thing? Okay. So w I was at NYU one year ahead of some of the other guys in the, that group. And we, I was in a sketch comedy troupe called sterile yak. And when we had to, how many troupe names are so funny to me? Yeah. <laughs> you have to come up with something, you know, exactly. And when, when we were, um, tasked with having to let new members in to the sterile yak, because it was a college group and we didn't want to because we thought we were in it to win it for their whole lives. And mm -hmm. so instead, one of the guys from our group left and started a junior varsity squad, like a, a B team, and that group became the state. Um, and they were the freshmen when I was a sophomore. And then you joined them. And then our group fell apart and then I begged to join the state, which I did right after that. And so th that's basically how I met Showalter because he was among those people that was why, part of the group. Why is he the one that you decided to write with out of all the people? Well, it was long. It was sort of after the state fell apart. Um, actually, no. Uh, well, I, I think I bonded most with Showalter because I, I did a visiting semester in the middle of college at Brown University, which is where Showalter had transferred to. And so we spent a lot more one-on-one -on -one time together there. And we just, you know, we drove back and forth a lot together to do state shows in New York while we were in Providence. Um, and we just had a lot of the same interests and, you know, we gravitated towards each other uh, creatively. You guys uh, are on a very similar frequency, which is a frequency that isn't, a lot of people do not have. And it seems yeah. like a huge find. Well, I definitely, I feel like, yeah, the, the, the mix of the two of us, because we, we have different, very different, we are very different, and but the, somehow the mix of our two things together did come, make a lot I of I don't cool know stuff. him. I know you well enough, and I know you're, what you guys have done together the best. And I do, so when I watch your stuff that you've done with him, I see so much of you that I could only assume that he is that too. And you saying you guys are different and you, you guys color each other in, what, how would you describe what his tone I mean, well, I personally, mean, but also could, what he offers. I mean, I, I could tell you, he, if a better way to answer that is look at the stuff he's done on his own, and you can see a lot more of what's sort of purely his color. You know, which well, the is, only stuff I've seen him do on his own, uh, or on his own, meaning without you, that I could that I'm aware of is Big Sick, which he didn't write, and Search Party, which he doesn't write. Well, also, hello, my name's Doris. I haven't seen that. Um, which is that is, something he wrote and directed? He, he wrote and directed that. Um, I mean, it's based on. He co-wrote it with someone who, based on their short film. But I mean, I think all three of those, though, do give you a sense of some of what he, you know, I, I mean, he, 
he has so many skills that I don't quite honestly. I mean, he, he really always had a, a real understanding of structure and, um, how to, you know, he, he really got interested in telling a well-told story over the years and he became a, he, you know, he kind of took a break from the business and was a professor of screenwriting at NYU for years. That's how he met my friend Sarah Violet Bliss. Yeah. And they, exactly. which she wrote on your, on, on, on Wet Hot as well. Yeah. And she's incredible. Yeah. He just comes, his parents are professors and he has a real intellectual um, approach to things. Um, but we had a lot of the same tastes and a lot of the same kinds of jokes and certain take on comedy that we, that we shared, of course. And so uh, it was a, it was a great partnership. Here's what I see that you two have in common. And um, I don't know if that's just the character he played, but in wet hot, it's just the tone of wet hot in general. That is very much you. And, Part of what attracted me so much to you, your projects, but then when I met you, is I, I see myself that way. Not not saying that I, I'm able to do what you do, but just the way your mind works in you some way. You could never do what I do. I believe that. <laughs> but I, I connect very much to your intention, at least what I'm projecting of it, which is very much the tone of Wet Hot, which is messing, you're, it's almost like you're fucking with people, but your intention isn't to fuck with them. And tell me if I'm wrong, but let me try to figure out a way to articulate this. The intent, this is at least for me and what I'm assuming is you. I like to, it seems like I'm fucking with people. My intention isn't to fuck with them, but if I acknowledge, if I tell them what I'm doing, it, it negates everything I've done. So what I want to do is play this thing that is messing with people, but I, I want them in on it. But the truth is, because of this frequency that is so rare, for better or worse, they're not going to inherently be in on it. The only way they will be is after the fact if you explain it or if you do what you've done so well, which is do it enough consistently and frame it in a way that is it's intentional, kind of what you did with your note on on They Came Together. Yeah, You're not winking to camera, but you're literally talking to it in a different universe. You said something that Upright Citizens Brigade did that I noticed that is a great instinct to develop, which is if you knew Amy, when Amy Poehler was talking about the abortion, if you knew this person next to you was a plant, you don't feel that tension that the, the bit inherently needs. But if you never found out that she was a plant, then there's just uncomfort and we're fucking with you. You're not in on it. And the balance in that sketch and the math of that is we establish the tension and the, and we make people believe one thing. And then we don't tell them it's fake, but this inner monologue bit inherently, at least subconsciously, is, oh, this is pre-planned. Now we're all in on it. There's a line that you have to break that to. And that's a very difficult dance to follow. It's something that I've been struggling a lot. I've been doing stand-up for 12 years, and I have a very hard time with it because I believe I'm so good at manipulating a room and making people feel a certain way, but I have poor instinct on when to let them, how or when to let them know this is all supposed to be this way. Got it. So what you guys do in Wet Hot that is so great, the bit, um, and I, I, I don't remember the math exactly, but the bit where he and the girl that he has a crush on, they're both cold, he gives her his yeah. jacket, and they exchange, and then he gets her jacket back, and then she says, I'm cold. He looks at her and he goes, yeah, me too. And it's, it's such a simple joke, but it's, there's, it's just real. He yeah. really doesn't recognize it. And that's credit to him as a performer, but also the tone and direction and the writing of what that is, is what I think, that's what you are. I want to tell a quick story that I'm remembering wrong of being on set at Futile, which was Sarah, your assistant at the time, on this job, she knows you better than anybody else here. She spends the most time with you. I don't know you that well. I met you an hour ago. And I stayed, you let me stay and watch because I wanted to shadow you. You were thirsty. And she said something, what do you want? And you got mad at her. It, I knew it wasn't real. You yelled something, uh, uh, get me a Gatorade, or it was something like that, where I thought that's so funny. Imagine somebody who is really mad then. That's the joke. She rolled her eyes. I don't know if it's because, oh, there's David, or because this guy's mad at me, but I have to do my job. But I, I, I know a lot of times in your life, speaking from experience, in your mind, it's an obvious joke. And in other people's mind, it's not maybe a joke. They know it's real and they're wrong. And what a what a misunderstanding and a seed could be planted. So this girl knows you well. And you've been nodding for like 15 seconds. I love that you connected. that. But will you talk on that? I, well, I've certainly gotten in trouble in my life, in my real life, for 
making what you said what what feel like real jokes but but with a certain enough subtlety that people take it exactly the wrong way or sometimes making what i consider a total non sequitur joke just saying something random and people saying wait wait i mean and t- trying to interpret or you know, give meaning to something when I'm like, no, really, truly, just it was a random comment. That's the difference. That's what I'm saying. When when the, when Upright Citizens Brigade plays that music, that's when they open the curtains. Right. And there's so, it's so small, but that one little thing completely opens the context and perspective to the people that aren't in on it. Well, in my real life, what I do often is I'll just say, joking, I'm joking. <laughs> I've noticed you do that. Yeah. Um, and I, I do it preemptively now because I know enough people... Can misinterpret it seemed like a, a, it seemed to me like a tick that maybe it kind of is but you just do it just in case it's a habit that i've purposely developed so that in case you think i'm not joking i'm joking <laughs> i have a bit that i say on stage and i'm not sure if i'm telling you this to connect with you or in a defensive place which is i want you to know i acknowledge this as well probably a little bit of both but i talk about because i have to do that too and i talk about on stage when i say something if it if a half a beat goes by and it doesn't get the reaction i i wanted I'll say, I'm joking, just joking. And then I'll explain the tool of you just, you, sometimes you got to shrug, put your two hands up, squint a little and say, I'm joking. People aren't going to pretend you didn't hear it, but they'll be like, okay. There's just saying I'm joking gives them something. But for me, saying I'm joking feels, and I'm a very competitive person, to have to say I'm joking makes me feel I did something wrong. Right. And I hate having to do that. But I love seeing movies and TV shows and trying to do in my own where you don't say I'm joking and those who get it like it all the more because you're not have to be explained it. And then that's, but that's why, you know, Wet Hot American Summer was a massive bomb. 90, most people <laughs> hated it. And the people, who, uh, yeah. the critics who saw it were like, what the fuck is they this? they didn't know what you were doing. Exactly. And then, so I'm just saying there wasn't, it didn't have that connector. It didn't have that bridge to make you understand it better. And we tried with other things with They Came Together to like give you a little more of that bridge. Um, but it still kind of is what it is. And the 10 and everything else, I've, a lot of things I've done have been like that. And with Stella, we thought we were doing this show that was just straight up funny stuff. Like we thought it, it, this was like for anybody. Uh, and it wasn't. It's because we, not just you and I, but people can't see, at least not inherently, outside of ourselves on what on perspective. I mean, that's why people have to sit people down and that's why we get defensive because we don't have that perspective. Is there a world where you could have both? Is there a world where you could do Wet Hot today if it hadn't come out yet and give enough of a context to the audience that doesn't in- understand and have that Everything that is different, but like in when we took on this thing, Role Models, it was an existing, pr- very commercial comedy yeah. movie. But That's your first studio film, correct? Yeah, and me and Ken Marino and Paul Rudd sat down and we're like, Let's imbue it though with some of what we really love without at all in any way working against what it is. Is that where there's four writers? There was the fourth one who I don't know. I remember there's, there was you three and a guy I didn't know. He was the one who wrote it originally. Yeah, he wrote it originally. And, and then it was brought to you. His, his like big broad strokes are still there. Um, and we, then you, Ken Reno, and Paul Rudd get together. And has Paul written before? Because I know you and Ken write. Not credited, but he's always worked on stuff. And, and, and he, he really did he majorly wrote on on role models and was he there for notes and everything along oh, yeah, the entire no, he process was, he was he was in the room the whole time he was okay. doing the whole thing with us um but yeah tim dowling's script was also based on there's another writer i think it credited his story with tim but basically the the thing had been developed in a million different ways and by the time we came out it was six weeks to shoot and then um but but no one thought that it was in great shape. And so, and there'd been 30 writers on the cover page of like, who's done all these revisions and stuff. And we didn't really look too much at that. We looked at the script we had and we just kind of rewrote a a movie that appealed to us, Mm -hmm. but also was not trying to like undercut what a studio movie is and what kind of movie it's supposed to be. And still wanted to be a, could you expand on that? Because I think the, the point of that is a studio movie needs to appe- appeal to a broader audience in the way that you said Wet Hot inherently couldn't. Yeah, exactly. So, how, so what's, what's, well, what do you do to open that? But I mean, part of it is the elements are what they are. It's Sean William Scott and Paul Rudd uh, and two kids are the you know central characters. And it's got a, a very specific, you know, a, a broad stroke story about like they take care of these two kids are the last people who should be taking care of little boys as, as big brothers. And through the course of the movie, they learn, you know, the lesson of, of what it is to care about somebody other than yourself. And the boys 
learn a listen a lesson about you know be who you are and, mm-hmm. and and so taking that basic idea and then just this general theme of um live action role play which was which was there i grew up playing magic the gathering and i had dungeons and dragons i wasn't huge into that but yeah. that fantasy world was something i grew up being a part of and there was something romantic yeah, about watching nerd, people who love that it's a story about nerds yeah and, you know and and so we took those elements and didn't want it and weren't <laughs> wasn't an option to nor did we try to change that but then within that we tried to give it some of just our personal flair that we thought was stuff that we found funny and little subtleties and under and over to give the whole story a flavor that was us and it seems like you did that in the characters less the situations like paul Rudd's yeah. uh, hating venti not being t- tall and then to find out it's 20 it's just this guy that is breaking down certain platitudes and certain things you're not supposed to say yeah that felt like what is david wayne-esque and yeah well that's actually paul's uh bit but then um we i it was sort of i think as a as memory is vague so i might be wrong and remember but i think it was me who sort of brought in the element of the barista's response to it being like everyone knows this you know like mm-hmm. like are you that stupid or something like that and um but then uh you know, we added the whole idea of kiss and we added the whole idea of the character of Elizabeth Banks and we kind of rethought the, rebuilt the character of um, Jane Lynch and, you know, just brought all... She the bunch of stuff. demolished that role, by the way. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Incredible. The the bit where she's talking about uh, cigarettes for breakfast and cigarettes for lunch. Yeah. Do you know what I had for dinner? Was it cigarettes? Yeah. Was Coc- that written? Cocaine. Or? Yeah. Oh, cocaine. Excuse me. Was that written or was that found there? Because it felt that to me that I it was found there. I think was written, actually. Yeah? yeah. Um, but... Uh, and by the way, I could be wrong, but um, yeah, th- there was a certain amount of improv on that, it's just the same, but a lot of it was on the page. So my introduction to the song Beth was, f- Kiss is Beth, was from your movie. Uh-huh. And at the end, when he sings Beth, who you're calling, and then he changes the words, but kept the name, I was like, oh, I remember my first thought, when did this movie come out, by the way? 2008. Yeah, so I had just started doing stand-up, I guess, because it seems more obvious now, but I still have this question. Oh, what a coincidence. What a lucky find. And then I realized, oh, no, they obviously named her Beth, so they could use this song. Yeah. That's right, correct? I think so. So in the script, her name is not Beth. You decide in pre-production, I want to use this song, so you just change it to Beth. Right, because it all connects to the kiss. It just seems like such a great payoff. Right, exactly, yeah. I think that's exactly what happened. But we know we use that same song in Wet Hot American Summer. I don't remember. Uh, Beth is the lead character yes, in Wet yes, Hot yes, Summer, and then in the movie, when she and David Hyde Pierce kiss, uh, the the song by Kiss plays just instrumentally, um, and it's the same. You do a few thing. jokes, and here's another one I'm not sure of, but I think I'm reading it properly. In uh, Role Models, there's a joke that he kept saying is a wing song, and Paul kept saying that's not a wing song. Right. That's is that even a, that, so? It's clearly not a wing song. Is that a real song even? <laughs> The so, so love take me down to the streets. Yes, what, love take me down to the that streets. That was a pure improv from eighty miles. Uh, so that's a fake song. Oh yeah, like they, they were. They, I love that. He was like, I, I don't even know what if any part of that was scripted, and then he was just like, love take me down. He just sang it off the cuff, and then um, <laughs> Paul Rudd did. They do that whole bit, and then in the in closing credits of of Role Models, we did a fully produced version of that song with a Paul McCartney impersonator doing the vocals. Love it, and it's a great song actually. And our friend Charles Gonzo, who's a brilliant musician, created a Wings song that sounds so Wings, even though it's faked and made up for the film. You can uh, see it on YouTube and on the Role Models soundtrack. Uh, hold up, I'll put on Spotify. <laughs> Um, fuck, I had another question about that and, and uh, I'll just have to lose it'll, it. It'll come back if, if it's Will meant it? to. If it's meant to. Do you believe if it's meant to? Because I mean... I don't know. Really? No, probably yeah. not. Yeah, okay. We've, we've, we're, we've done a fair amount of talking. Um, so here's where I'd like to acknowledge because I want to take, take a moment. We got everything that's needed. Good. But I want to take advantage of having you here for another few minutes. Great. For the video feed. We're, so, uh, so for the uh, iTunes, uh, we're going to take an edit right here. Uh, but for the video, I'd love for you to to do a magic trick just to the people at home while I'm in the bathroom. Is that something you could do? Do you have your cards with you? Uh, yeah, but I need you. All right. No, well, I c- we'll, or I guess I could. Do I a trick. We'll do one when I'm here too. But do a trick while I go pee. Uh, make sure that you're obviously to camera, but make sure you're no. I can't. To the I can't do it. I can't do it. I need you. People enjoy that. I'll talk to them while you're away. Okay. Hi everybody. 
What's going on? What's up? You guys are great. Um, so I've enjoyed hanging out with Rick. He's a nice guy. He's also a sweet guy. Here, I'll do this trick. Okay, so here's a Rubik's Cube. Um, I'm going to mix it up. Um, and um, so um, here it's all, so it's all like um, mixed up, right? Now, I don't know if you can see this. Maybe I'll have to zoom in. If it's 4K, then you can. So here's the idea. Ready? We just uh, throw it up in the air. And look at that. It's solved. How about that? Solved on all the sides. I don't know. Maybe he'll be back soon. Um, yeah. Hey, dude. I did a trick for them. Was it good? Yeah, it was a Rubik's Cube trick. I showed them. I, I saw it. It worked. You might have to zoom in on it on the That's on the four like K. Yeah, me too. I did it. I did this promo uh, for the, um, the Wet Hot book, and sh it was sh I shot in all four K, and I just like brazenly zoomed in and moved around in every single shot later. So right. nice. Yeah. Uh, also, something I just noticed in the bathroom, which I, I would have liked if you had told me, uh -oh. my dick looks huge. You didn't yeah. say anything. I did say it. You were, you were off in one of your monologues, and I whispered it. Oh, so, so disrespectful the way you said that. So I'm going to, um, to call it a monologue. I guess I could just push in or do something, but I apologize for those watching. My dick looks, I guess looks, is enormous, and it's, you could see it through. Yeah, it's great, though. Thank you. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit more on something that's very personal to me that I connect with you on. This very much might be one-sided, but what I talked to you before about, which is this idea of me knowing something's a joke and also me not recognizing, I'm better at this now, but for the most part, not recognizing that people think I'm being serious. And you said you've gotten in some trouble with that before. Yeah. How have you learned from that? And also, and more specifically, the thing that you do as a writer and a director is so good. That, that thing where people, is he serious? It doesn't work if they know. It's so good, but it's contextualized in the bit, so it works. But in your personal life, yeah, when you say you've gotten in trouble, I don't mean as a kid getting like grounded and stuff. I, I mean like part you of growing with, up is with a, women or... Yeah, with, I think part of growing up is I've learned a little more over the years when a certain kind of joke is not going to be taken either uh, at the the way it's intended or how to how to shave it differently or i mean i will often subconsciously make jokes that i know certain people in around the table will get and others won't on purpose right <laughs> um i think i've learned how to without really intending to how to refine jokes in normal conversation so that they hit the audience that they're intended to hit, you know. When we uh, screened um, a few talent stupid gesture, not at Sundance, but when we screened it in Los Angeles, like a friends and family, a more intimate setting. Uh, afterwards, you're the director of this movie, and everyone is coming up to you. You know the good jobs and the congratulations, and they want to probably be around you the same way when you're a kid. You want to sit next to the birthday boy or whatever. There's still something genuine there. These people are your friends, but you kind of are the director of a screening and you have like a certain gravitas in that moment. And I thought it was so funny and probably honest that in that moment you were walking around, everyone's in like little pockets and you're walking around and people say to you, good job. And a lot of times it wasn't even a thank you. I watched you do this a few times. You just responded by pulling out a deck of cards and saying, you want to see a magic trick? Mm. Like this little autistic boy that doesn't understand where he is. Right. And then you do the magic trick, which you're an amazing magician. So, uh, for those of you listening, check out the YouTube to see some of these magic tricks coming up. But there's something funny in this seemingly unaware man who's awkwardly saying, do you want to see a magic trick? And then doing an amazing magic trick and then leaving and going to the next person and doing it yeah. where it almost feels like a character. But I also know this is an honest intention. Do you understand what I'm, yeah, what I'm sure. talking about? Well, I think, I mean, so many magicians became magicians because of social awkwardness and mm -hmm. as a way in to interact with people. But these are people that are in this moment, I know this is a gross way of explaining it, but at a lower status than you. 
as far as like this is your party yeah where you don't need to do that yet you do it so i'm curious is that still coming from a defensive place do you love just to do magic what was that i mean i go through phases where i'm really into magic and doing card tricks i mean i i've I, it's, it's been a serious hobby for me for a long time that i study a lot and spend a lot of time on and i go through phases where i'm really into doing it for other people and i guess i was in a phase at that time of that and so and yes i i probably you're pointing out something that maybe I wasn't even as conscious of, which is that that sort of compulsory compliments that you get after a screening, what, you know, whether people like it or not, they're like, that wasn't great. I'm right. like, I just not interested. That's not, I don't know. I'd rather do a magic trick. Yeah. Cause also, even if they really love it, it's, it's like, I don't know, there's better time and place to, to receive those kind of discussions. Like it's, you know, you pointing out things you liked in, uh, Wet Hot American Summer, you know, 20 years later, while we're sitting here, just is a registers with me in a more real way than after a screening. And, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I find when things are said and done during a, a moment of obligation, which has nothing to do with their feeling, just what's built into yeah. the, the energy. It's it's dis, it seems disingenuous. I have a very hard time when people say, how you been? Just say, what do you want from me? Yeah, because it doesn't. It, what do you want from me? So yeah, when you get like after a comedy set and people say good job, text me in an hour if you if you want to tell yeah, me that. Yeah, if you get yeah, I, I will send. Or if I get an email the next day, then I know because that's where you know that that wasn't necessary. I yeah. now feel I have this not a trick, but this cool understanding of that. That when I I went to a friend of mine screening, Kyle did this movie that comes out in June. Um, called Murder Mystery. I don't know if you, the Sandler and Jennifer Aniston. It's this Netflix oh, yeah. film. It's very cool. It's I know, big. I, I know all about it. Yeah. So Kyle Nuchek directed it, and this is his first uh, at that level movie. And I went to the screening. It was at the Arc Light, which was, by the way, so cool. They give me a red ticket, and in, with this red ticket, I get my own line at the Arc Light, mm. and in that line, my own snack line, and I got a hot dog, bunch of crunch, and a popcorn, and a water. No, I brought a water. They didn't charge me. And I, it's it's not that big of a deal saving eighteen it's definitely bucks. Definitely not. But there's something. I'm at the screening of my friend's movie. I just and the free snacks put it at a different level where my life is amazing that I have this cool access. I get free snacks. Anyway, point is the movie ends. I leave and Sandler, who's one of the kings to me, is there and Kyle's there. I see Kyle and Kyle gives me a respectable eye contact as if to say, "Come on over," and you know. But for the same reason why in an, ob in an obligatory state, I don't feel it's genuine. I just said, I'm going to go. Great job. It was just a cool out I felt for myself. But then then to call him later and tell him how I felt, I just felt like I'm, I, I kind of get it. I felt good about myself in yeah. that moment. Yeah. That, I, I, I wish I had something interesting to add, but I get it. And that's, yeah. Well, that's a sweet way to acknowledge what I said. Yeah. I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm done. I'm having a great time. I mean, the dopamine's going. I got the, the caffeine in this. So I apologize for ra rambling. But what you just did is something that I've learned recently. The way you acknowledged me that I'm going to tell one of my monologues, one of these stories. Jackie Tone, sure. who you know, played Gilda Radner in our movie. Yeah. We dated years ago. Yeah. And there was a moment where she was telling me stuff and I was listening to her. In fact, I could still tell you what she said. Mm -hmm. I heard everything. Then she was done and then I just looked at, and, and I didn't say Oh, I didn't, I didn't say, oh. Oh, yeah, you got to. I remember she got mad at me in a sweet way. Jackie's, I love her. She's great. But she was a little upset that her boyfriend wasn't listening to her. And I, what, do you, what do you want from me? And she said, you just have to say, oh. And that feels so obligatory to me that when someone's done, I go, oh. But you just did it very efficiently. You had nothing to say. You registered what I did. And you told me that in a way that I feel is very connective and sweet. People need to know they've been hurt that's a genuine human need I that, that all humans need and, you know they always say that more, more than anything people want to just be heard and everyone receives receives people differently yeah so to me i feel that you're being heard if i'm making eye contact and not and maybe a, an honest nod because if i wasn't interested or listening i would probably say to you in a way that is coming off aggressive and i've learned it okay right so if I'm there, I'm there, but people don't know that. Right, and I've been in relationships where <laughs> I'm like, what, you know, what's the problem? And they're like, well, I don't like when I'm trying to tell you something that's important to me and you're going like this. Oh my <laughs> God, I, that happens. Uh, yeah, I'm like, you why, what's the problem? Up sign. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Right, 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 right. Get to the, get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it's so, it is so disrespectful. Like watching that's you horrible. do it. 
There's really no perfect way to communicate, and it's so important to be on a similar frequency, and if you're not, to at least have the appreciation of those frequencies, because... There's only so far you could go in with a person to reach an equilibrium of, of that I mean, type of energy. I mean, it's a very tough thing because sometimes I'm on the other end of that and I appreciate when someone says, you don't need to explain this whole thing. I actually already understand where you're headed. You can skip to the next part of what you're getting to, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but nine times out of 10, that is not taken well, you know? And so I'm try I try to be sensitive to that, but- do you, you know. connect strongly with the people that, that one out of 10? Do you recognize that consciously? Like, oh, these people communicate directly. They understand me. I feel I understand them. Does that make you more attracted to them? Sometimes it's just, you know, obviously there's a very thin line between impatience and efficiency or, or, or rudeness and just, you know, but I, I will, if I'm in a pitch meeting or something or in a creative meeting and someone says, I, I get it, move on, you know, I, I will generally appreciate that. If they, if I feel like they're being honest, if I feel like they do get it and they don't need me to elaborate anything. I like being directed that way. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember I asked you a couple of questions once about something and you said, uh, it was two different times and we didn't end up doing it. Both times you said, no, we got it. And I, I didn't think you were shutting me down, which you maybe were. I just thought, oh, he, great. He yeah. got it. Well, I do have, I do feel like sometimes people are overly verbose or they repeat things they repeat their point, and I do this sometimes too. You repeat it again. You say something, then you say, like I'm doing right now, you say something and then you say the same thing again in different words. And That's part of that need to be understood. Yeah, and I catch myself doing that, and, I, and I'll say like halfway through the next sentence, I'm like, I actually just said this, so I don't need to repeat myself. You know, And I feel like some people are really annoying, like they'll just continually make the same point over and over again, and that you know, I get annoyed by that, but it's a it's a balance sometimes again people it's not that they didn't impart the information the first time it's that they just want to say it again <laughs> my best friend from home jeff carp his uh his bachelor party years ago i met his his wife's brother and his wife's brother has a stutter and he he, he would take some time t time to get stuff out and he conditioned us but me specifically early by saying if you know what i'm going to say finish it for me Mm. So there is a level of being respectful, but it, you could say respectful, and he would then say thank you. So to me, and that was my first uh, personal experience talking to somebody for multiple days with a stutter like that. So it kind of calibrated me of that's what you're supposed to do with people who stutter. I don't know that for sure. <laughs> I don't know if that's generally the case. It wasn't until recently that I had a conversation with you because I've still not had too many conversations with people like that. And I remember I said to Jeff this, and he goes, well, that's him, not necessarily everybody. Yeah. Like, there's certain rules I think are default. Like, when there's a seeing-impaired person, you're not supposed to grab their arm. You put yours out so they could grab yours. So you're guiding them uh, instead of leading them type of thing. The point I'm making is everybody communicates different, and I love – I now, when I meet somebody new, especially if it's a potential romantic relationship, uh, I love to kind of calibrate up top – by saying a few of the things that I know could be misunderstood. One of the things I say is, I smoke pot, by the way. So if we're smoking pot and I don't know this person very well, this will definitely, I'll definitely say this, which is, um, I sometimes I get a little silly and I do a lot of bits. I want you to do me a favor. If I'm ever being too much, please give me the benefit of the doubt one time, one time, and just be like, Rick, you gotta knock it off. And then if I do it again, you could leave. But there's a chance that I won't know that. Yeah. And tell me once, and then I'll I'll, I'll be good. You're gonna love. I know. I mean, I'm awesome. Sounds there's, like you found a really great trick to get chicks. It's a great jokes aside. It, it truly is a great trick to connect with people in a way that I always thought I was connecting with them. Yeah. Most people won't tell you, David, you're being annoying, or you're being loud, or you're being mean. They'll just, oh, okay. Or then, so, yeah, and then you don't learn anything. Again, I I hear you. Nothing to add to this okay. to that piece. So before we're done, I want to have you uh, sign these things. Okay. Great. I love it. I'll try to stay in the camera shot. And you could do your name or a little message. I, I'm not selling this, so it could, it could be personalized. I hope not. Oh, what a good movie, man. What a good movie. Thank you. Rick, you, Rick, you, me, special. You are special. You are special with a uh, XO and a.
Star of David. Okay. Oh, nice. It didn't seem like you liked that. I acknowledge your feelings. I want you to know I do like it. It didn't offer me any type of surprise of like getting something I wasn't already expecting. Okay. Did you mind putting the cap on that before? <laughs> Thank you for being you. You're a good artist, I think. Apparently, you use some device that lets you put this back. Or would you? you use some device? Your Instagram so drawings? Yeah, I make uh, drawings on Instagram using a thing called Camera Lucida. Yeah, it's a, it's really a one man uh, developer, a great guy who uh, makes this amazing app that you can know. <laughs> so you uh, did a drawing of me as Harold Ramis, which, yeah. by the way, I still want if you have it. I think I do still. Somewhere. I would love it. And that picture of me as Harold Ramis is the cover art of this podcast now. Great. But that is uh, that is. I don't know if it's a full circle. I think so. Which to me is, is to call something a full circle seems a little redundant because if it's not full, it's not a circle. It's just a you. So well, a circle no, is inherently a full. It can be a broken circle. It can be, an, it can be a non, it could be a half circle. Could That's be a, a you. Quarter circle. Okay. I don't know. You heard it here first. It could be a quarter circle, but we don't <laughs> you know. You heard it here first. My name, th th thank you for ch tuning in to Take Your Shoes Off with a special guest Wet Hot American Summer and Role Models and other things. Is David went? You know what? Let me do the tighter. Oh. Is there one? Is there, if I want to say one. And I would like to acknowledge our host, Rick Glassman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, make sure to tune in next week when our uh, guest will be uh, Paul Rudd. Could you help me get Paul Rudd? I'll do podcast? my best, yeah. Would you actually I'll reach out to I him? Can see what I can do. Bradley Cooper? Yeah, sure. You've heard it here first. <laughs> my name is Rick Glassman. Make sure to tune in next week with our special guest is. Dude, saying goodbyes are so hard. Signing off is tough. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. All right, now that everything's off, my dick looks good, right? Scoot doo, blabbery blue. Scoot dee, oh yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>